to you with them. Father, I do pray and I'll continue to pray. This is a church where your presence always is here. Father, for without you we have nothing. Holy Spirit, it's not that you're even invited here. You're here. Father, may we invite our hearts to open up to what you want us to hear, what you want us to do, Father. Father, your presence is here. Your Son is here. Your Spirit's here. Father, you're here. You're all here. And Father, now may we join with you even more as we learn from your word, the truth, Father, that only you have, the way that only you can teach us. So guide our hearts and teach us. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're looking at Paul. We're seeing him start his first missionary journey. He's already gone to all the churches, and now he's settling back around Antioch. And he's received a word that we looked at two weeks ago or last week. He received a word that there's some Judaizers showing up and they're starting to distort the gospel truth. And the accusations against Paul indicated that he was purposely watering down the divine standard to make it easy for one to know Christ. One might ask, well, how so, Pastor Mike? How is this happening? In his letter, he replies to a question Paul does, and he asks them, am I seeking the favor of men? Wow. What a question. Am I seeking the favor of you? No. I've already got favor. It's from the Lord Jesus Christ. He owns me, He bought me, He purchased me, and He loves me. And I don't want to seek your favor. I want to seek your love for Christ as you see my love for His. I want you to join me in a banquet of love for Jesus Christ. That's what I want us to do. I want you to think about it. The legal system in place that was there demanded much out of the believer regarding the keeping of the Old Testament law. The Mosaic Covenant, the Old Testament law, was given to Israel now in three parts. It was given, number one, in the commandments expressing the righteous will of God. We know that as the Ten Commandments. Most of the time, that's what we look at. Let me tell you, there's Exodus 21 to Exodus 24. 21, 22, 23, 24. Three chapters that are there on the judgments concerning the social life of Israel. Just their social life. And then there's another part that comes in. It's the ordinances that govern the religious life of Israel. And that's about six chapters in its own. In your handout back there, I wrote every, I didn't write them. I copied and pasted every one of those down. And I read these over the week. And I understood the love of God and His grace in a more, more better way. In a, more, in a better way than I ever have in my whole life. There's one... You know I grew up on a ranch, right? But if you don't, I did. I know I don't look like I hated it. I was a mama's boy. I told you. There's one right here that could have got us taken out. If an ox cattle, right, gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall surely be stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten. The owner of the ox can go unpunished. Good deal. If you ever had neighbors, that's why they had fences. I'm going to tell you something. There was a lot of goring going on. Well, watch this. If, however, condition, an ox was previously in the habit of gory and its owner had been warned, yet he does not confine it and kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner shall be put to death. Rules and regulations. You see, Paul knew these rules and regulations well because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and he was a chief man that was going forward with the churches tearing them apart because he was demanding that you absolutely had to have blamelessness only by the law. And we're going to see where Christ met him on the road and now he turned the law into grace. You see, the commandments and ordinances are one complete and inseparable whole, all the ones I just showed you. When an Israelite sinned, he was held blameless if he brought the required offering to make him blameless. Can I tell you that you're blameless now because of the righteousness in you? Do you know that? There is no more offerings. The Lamb of God is your offering. It is your righteousness. It is your foundation. It is your strength. It is your rock. It is your purpose. Amen. You are whole without blame because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did for you in the death and resurrection. You have been born again. You're not the same. You're not the same. 
You have the love of Christ residing in you. What else you have? You have the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at some of the required offering that was there. Look at Luke 1 6. It says, They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blameless in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And in Philippians, Paul wrote, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more should do that. Because why? Because I was circumcised on the eighth day, the law said, of the nation of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, which is the priestly tribe. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to the righteous, which is the law, I am absolutely found blameless, said Paul, because of the law. But the law would not get him into the kingdom, would it? Amen. Not get him into the kingdom. There's one way of the kingdom is to the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And no other way is there. See, the law was a method of God dealing with man, characterized as a period extending from the giving of the law to the death of Jesus Christ. Look at Galatians 3, 12 through 14. Jumped way ahead because we're still in chapter 1. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Before faith came, in other words, before Christ came, we were kept in custody under the law. This is Paul talking. And remember, Paul made the transition. He was of the law. Christ came. Christ stayed. Now he's in grace. He made the transition from the Old to the New Testament. What, what a change. See, we're fortunate. We're born into grace. We're born into born into sin, but we're of the grace period in the Old of the New Testament. We didn't have to go and work in the temple and do all the laws and all of a sudden, whoops, curtain's torn. Nobody's going to sew back together. Now we're going to have to go in grace. Now it's by grace that we're saved. So we've got to get out of our mind all those old things that used to make us feel blameless and right before God because you now are right before God because of the final sacrifice, Jesus Christ. We still kind of hung up on that, aren't we? We still think if we do these certain things that we'll be a better Christian, won't we? You may need better obedience to God, but let me tell you, you're as saved as you're going to get. You're as saved as you're going to get. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He continues on and Paul said, Therefore, this law became our tutor, it became our teacher to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, now that Jesus Christ has come, we no longer need to be the law. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Have you put your clothes on Christ? What's that look like, man? <laughs> it's that armor that goes on too, isn't it, for the battle? How are you clothed with Christ? Let me tell you, you're clothed, clothed with Christ. You've got a peace and a hope and a love that surpasses anything you ever had before you knew Him. You know how to love your enemy as yourself. You know how to love your neighbor as yourself. You know how to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. And when trouble and turmoil comes into your life, you look for where God is working there so you won't go crazy trying to figure out what it means. Look for God in all events. He's there. Don't hear me tell you that He causes all things to happen because He has nothing to do with evil. But He'll take care of what evil does. He'll turn it around and show you a way that people will come to Him because of that evil. I told you when my brother passed away at the age of three, many people came to Christ. My only problem was, do I need to go ahead and pass away that the people come to Christ? Or do I need to worry about Him passing away? That little guy led more people to Christ than most people were in their lifetime. He was three years old. God used him for His glory. Did God cause the death? Absolutely not. Sin caused the death. For all have sinned and come short to glory. Let me put this another way. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, having yourself clothed with Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man. Listen to this. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants and your heirs according to the promise. You are an heir of the kingdom. Let me put it another way. Paul was trying to tell these people as they crossed over from Judaism into Christianity, was trying to tell them, remember, remember the transition from the Old Testament to the New. Look, guys, the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now the way of faith has come. We no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been unified with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. And there's no longer a Jew or Gentile. There's not slave or free. There's no more male or female. They're all one in Christ. Amen. Because you were created in His image. Your heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. You say, wait a minute. Surely the law had a purpose better believe it did. Talk about the purpose of the law. But the commandments of the law are absolutely God's idea. They came directly from Him. The most referred to, of course, are the Ten Commandments. The law was given because God's redeemed people, the ancient children of Israel, were becoming rebellious and becoming ungrateful and were destroying one another. No one since has improved on those in the 3,000 years. Their completeness perfect as you can get. Man is not capable of coming up with these commandments. However, we are not saved by the Ten Commandments. Why? Not because there's anything wrong with them. Hear me. Because there's something wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with us. It points our way to Christ. It shows that we can't keep the law and need a Savior that can keep the law. Let me get ahead of myself. Let me tell you something. In Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Well, I'll not. I'll do that. I got to do it later on. I'm going to push it up a little bit. I'm going to go back. It's that man, boy. I want you to look at Romans 8, 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Do you know you're free from the law of sin and death? Do you know you're free? Don't let sin's grip keep a hold on you and keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Don't you dare let Satan have an ear with you that tells you that you're no good. My Bible says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I can do zero. I can say zero to the infinity. Whatever that. And here's the interesting thing that we must never forget about the law. The Ten Commandments, as perfect and complete as far as you and I can go in having a moral code, hear this, they are inferior to what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount and what the Holy Spirit can lead one to be and what the Holy Spirit can lead one to do. You see, now the Holy Spirit resides in each of you. The coming of the Holy Spirit didn't come until Christ ascended back into heaven. And now He lives in us teaching each one of us. That's why we don't need another priest. We have a high priest now that we can talk to God with and through. Look at this Matthew 5. I'll read a few of these. And Jesus opened His mouth and began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit. You've got to realize, if we've got the legal beagles sitting over here, the Judaizers, and we've got the Gentiles who are this worst of worst that can be, by the way, that's us. Unless you're Jewish, you're a Gentile with me, okay? We're sitting over here and all of a sudden their ears perk up when Jesus starts saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute. That's us. These guys over here aren't poor in spirit. They're keeping the law. They're telling us that they're blameless. We ain't got a chance, man. In the court that we even go into, we can't even get past the first place. We don't even get to go in where the Jewish ladies go. We're even behind that. That's how worthless we are. Poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Are you kidding me? They're including us in this. Jesus is including us, not just the Jewish people. And the Jews are sitting there thinking, wait a minute. Did you come to abolish the law? Did you come to condemn it, Jesus? Right in between here, there's that beautiful process that Jesus says. And He says, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came 
came to fulfill it. And fulfill it he did. He did it so perfectly and did away with the need for the law. And he ushered in that age of grace, that beautiful grace that saves us. Please don't let works, please don't let your past sin hold you down from living a life with Christ. If you need to tell me what you've done, I can beat it. I can match it. <clears throat> Paul's the one we look at. In Timothy, we see that I think I've already told you where there's those that killed their fathers and done that. Well, I'll pull the plug on him when he's in the hospital, so that may be going there. I had to. I had to. Mother told me she could have to. Sorry, honey. <laughs> and then there's those that killed their mother. I didn't kill him, but the hospital was being I just came out. <laughs> A.D. A.D.D. <laughs> You're looking at a patch of this guy that took attention to our deficit. Wow. Those that killed their mothers, those that killed their fathers, the liars, the perjurers, and Paul sits right there in a few verses later, and he says, this is a trustworthy statement that all have sinned and come short, of course, the glory of God. And he says, I am the chief sinner of all. So Paul's claim, number one, again, let's fight over number two. I'll take number two. But after that, let's claim the righteousness of Christ in our life. Then we can move forward with the gospel message and love one another and show the world the light of Christ because it is a dark place. But He came and He's the light. See, Jesus gave an application one after another of showing the Holy Spirit how it leads a person in the way of the law that it could not. Look at John 15, 26. When the Helper comes, says Jesus, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Holy Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. One of the signs of your life that you have Christ is the Holy Spirit telling you what? Go tell that man, go tell that woman, tell that child about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whether you do or not, that's up to you and God, but that's a sign you're pretty much saved right there because you're wanting the testimony of what He did for you to go forward. We just have to get ourselves out of the way. Look at John 16, 7. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, said Jesus. For if I don't go away, the helper of the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Therefore, all those who believe the Holy Spirit dwells in them. And you have the mind of God, the helper, coming to help you walk in this life. And tell you the truths of Scripture, to help you interpret Scripture, to help you pray, to help you walk with God. See, God is complete. He didn't leave one thing undone. You see, the commandments of the law are inferior compared to the righteousness of the Holy Spirit also. Why do I say this? Because the Ten Commandments specifically could not, never ever will produce an inward righteousness. It only created an outward work to help one be blameless. Only if they completed it in a way that God specifically told them in all these 14 pages of 12 times. An inward righteousness comes from the heart. An outward righteousness to be seen is what you do grudgingly and that out of fear of punishment. Praise God that we're not under the law. Because every time I got up here, I had to go sacrifice something to make sure everything was right. This service would last for days. And the blood would be running out of this place like you couldn't imagine without a sacrifice. It would be a river of blood. But today the blood has been spilled on the cross our Savior is risen and we stand here in grace and are able to love one another in a way those guys couldn't. Isn't that amazing? We understand the privilege of being born today. One nation under God. Fourth of July, right? Let me reinstate this. You're in the best nation in the world. Amen. Amen. Would you let anybody tell you this place is junk? God still lives here. And we'll shine our light, we'll be just fine. We don't need to worry about anybody else, we'll just shine our light, and the presence of Christ will be seen in this beautiful body of believers of His. When the law was given, the motivation for keeping it was out of fear and punishment. As I previously said, there is nothing wrong with the law, but there's a lot wrong with us. We are weak, we're sinful, we're frail human beings, and it's no way a man or woman would ever keep the law. That's why Christ came. He is the keeper of the law. 
And He keeps it for each one of you. And He goes up before the Father and He tells them, guilty, not charged. Grace, He has my righteousness. God says, boom, come in. Not guilty. Wow. The precious of your salvation is important. Now you know why Paul is fighting for the gospel of Jesus. He doesn't want any other way. He doesn't want it distorted. He wants the truth presented there. It's by grace you're saved. You see, the legalistic teachers were trying to mingle <coughs> the law of grace. And it was being presented as the divine method for the newly established churches. And Paul would absolutely have none of it and will have none of it here in this precious church of his also. Jesus himself addressed the false teachers within the church as, get this, wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm going to tell you, Pastor Rick and I, we don't never want to put that suit on. We're never going to put it on either, by the way, so you don't have to worry about that. No, we're people in sheep's clothing covered by the blood of Christ. We've been called to send His message, the gospel message, to beautiful people like y'all that God has saved to help equip y'all to go about in your mission that God has called each of you to, and that's to spread the gospel message. However you do it, whether it's a quilt, whether it's a call, whether it's a prayer ministry, whether it's a ladies' ministry, what, whatever that is, and God is calling you to, we want to help equip you to do that. Maybe it's just praying for your own precious family and your own children. That's enough. You mamas that get to stay home, God bless you. Raise those children. By the way, my poor mama, bless her heart, she, oh, I don't know how she did it. <laughs> All boys. One of them didn't make it. That's how bad it was. Jesus himself addressed the false teachers. Wolves and sheep's clothes. Look at Matthew 7, 15 through 16. Look at this. Jesus, beware of the false prophets, Mike, who will come in sheep's clothing, but enter into the ravages of wolves. Mike, you'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from the thorn bushes and are figs from the thistles, are they? Lord, no, they're not. Lord, keep my eyes and heart open to watch out and protect this precious body of believers. Lord, I'm going to make some mistakes because that's all right. I got grace. We'll take care of that. There's several things. Even adding works to Christ's complete work is heresy. In other words, it's blasphemy. Romans 11.6 warns us against attempts to mix grace. Look at this. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's grace choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Ephesians tells us you're saved by the grace of God through faith and nothing we can add to it or take away from it. Galatians 1, 6-9 even pronounces a curse on anyone that we read about a couple weeks ago. Let them be anathema. Let them be destroyed. Who changes the good news of salvation grace. Do you see the warnings in Scripture? Wow! Paul was standing up for a cause that he was for many long, many, many years ago. And now he was standing up evidence of a new man and a new birth. Where are you standing now? You know, it'd be well if we'd all make it to make our goal to follow the lead of the first church and the gospel preached by the Apostle Paul and the others of Scripture writing and the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit in avoiding the pitfalls of false doctrine. Let me tell you what they did to avoid the pitfalls of false doctrine. You ready? Acts 2.42 says this. I'm going to put it this. Light of Hope Bible members are going to devote themselves to the teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And such devotion will protect us and ensure that we are on the path Jesus set for. Can I tell you that we are on the path that Jesus set for us? <laughs> I get the beautiful privilege of seeing it. I see ministries being birthed up. I've been prayed for. One is forming up now. It's the prayer ministry. And guess what? It was going on and all of a sudden God says, I want these people at this church. It looks like we'll continue on with it. It's the prayer ministry. Do you know one of the most important ministries in the church, if not the most important, is the prayer ministry? I need to be covered in prayer every day. I need my precious souls to be covered in prayer every day. I need to be what we call prayed up. Because 
the last time I checked, the devil's on the loose. And he's there to devour anyone he can. And you know who he's going to devour? How he's going to tear you up because you leave and worship up here with all these people. You know what? You've got a chance. You know what? Because we're going to flee from the devil. That's what scripture said. Just get away from him. You might want to fight him. I'm going to leave you on your own on that one. You follow me because I'm running. <laughs> As you flee from the devil. Look, we live in a society, and I'll wrap this up because I want to do the Lord's Supper. I love the Lord's Supper. We live in a society nowadays that there's many false doctrines out there. See, we live in the idea that there are many paths to God. I was talking with a young lady this morning, and she said, I'm around people, they talk about Buddha, Hare Krishna, they talk about Dalai Lama, and all those. And I said, You know what? That's all right. We're going to do the Mars Hill deal, man. we got the unknown statue sitting right here, the unknown marker for the God. We know who that is. Can I introduce Jesus Christ to you, all these gods? He's the one you can go talk to yourself. You can't go figure these other boys out. You can go to God and help you figure yourself out. That's what he'll do. John says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that ever believes in Him shall not perish. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through Him. And Jesus Himself says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. There is only one way to God. And by the way, everyone's invited. <coughs> but not everyone says no. It's heresy when you have any teaching that redefines the person of Christ. God's Word says who He is, and that's what stands, and nothing else stands. It's His Word. John says, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see where they are from, God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Here's your clue. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, that is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you've heard that is coming and is now already in the world. Pretty simple, huh? And finally Paul comes in and tells the law to fulfill by Christ. And now the righteousness is now in you. Your, hear me, your conscience is now clean because you know Christ. Your conscience is clean. Many of you, not, many of you may not have realized that yet, but today I want you to know that your conscience is clean. Jesus didn't lie upon the cross, hanging there, saying, you are forgiven of your sins when you accept me except for whatever you're thinking right now. Except for what you did on that day. It is all inclusive. His blood covered it all. Except for that one person. Except for that divorce. Except for that. 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 Wash it away with the blood of Christ. You're unblemished as white as snow. What can wash away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let me read this. I want to and we'll start to do the Lord's Supper. I love this. Hebrews, if you, if you want to get into something, this old, new, inclusive Hebrews is where to go. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but He came through and entered the tabernacle through His own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled, remember this is the old law that I just talked about, all these, it's gone. For if the blood, where am I? For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling on those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ Jesus, who through the eternal Spirit offer Himself without blemish, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? <coughs> he allows you now to serve the living God. For this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant, a new covenant of grace, so that 
since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, and now their conscience is clean. What's holding you back from believing that you can walk with Christ in a way that keeps your head up in obedience to Him? What thing have you got a hope to that maybe people are using against you? What's there? is keeping you from experiencing the love of Christ in a walk of peace and harmony with Him and doing life. Whatever that is, would you just give that up to the Lord? And by the way, put a no return to sender on it, will you? Don't let it come back. If it does, send it to me. I'll get it out of here. Do something with it. Don't receive it. Look, Paul summed it up in chapter 1, verse 10, and we're going to get into the other verses next week. He says, If I were still trying to please men, I would now not be a bondservant of Christ. <clears throat> grace is set in contrast with the law. Under the law, God demands righteousness from men. Under grace, He gives righteousness to men. The law is connected with Moses and works and grace with Christ and faith. Under the law, blessings accompany obedience under grace, it bestows blessings as a free gift. You already accepted the free gift that Jesus Christ has given you through grace. I pray that you will use that in a way that guilt and shame will leave you and you will stand righteous before God because of His Son, Jesus Christ, in obedience, walk in a way that pleases Him. Not me, not each other. Men, lead your families with grace. Show them what Jesus looks like to your children, your grandchildren. Men, can I ask you to step up? And there's a few of you who have stepped up. I appreciate that. But kick it up to a new level. Don't worry about anybody else making you happy or sad. Just go to God and let Him do that for you. Will you? Let anger go away. Don't allow others to determine your value and your worth. It's already been determined by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who death on the cross. The Lord's Supper is rich in meaning. No one is really worthy to commune with God. It's only by the virtue of the shed blood of Christ that we have been made worthy. <coughs> Biblical communion should be open to all believers, and it is those who believe in Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's so only those that have, I ask to participate in this. Before taking communion, as I've asked us to do at the very beginning, we look at ourselves and examine. We see sin in our lives, yes, but Christ has cleansed the sin. A quick confession is all it takes. But remember, this is a celebration. This is something we're doing in remembrance of what He's done for us. His life in the earth, His blood shed upon the cross, and the forgiveness of our sins. And we want to partake in this, and He's told us that He will partake in it again until we're back at the banquet of heaven. So we look past at the old. Get rid of that. We look at the presence and the remembrance now. And we look in the future to having the Lord's Supper with the Lord Jesus Himself. What a day that's going to be. Wow. Can you imagine Jesus serving you the Lord's Supper? <laughs> wow. What a glorious day that's going to be in heaven. Amen. Yeah.